Today, on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we light a candle for love. We have lit candles for joy and peace and hope. But today it's love, love that makes us burst out in song or in quiet whisper. Love that you can see a mile away and love that can only be seen by the one being loved. Love is connection. Love is reaching out. And at Christmas, as we recognize God in the baby Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, we experience the love that inspires music and intimate whispers. The love that we can all see and the love that is personal and life-changing. Today, we light our fourth candle in love. It is Advent, which means that some of us are excited and some of us are feeling warm and happy and we come to worship to celebrate. But in a time of pandemic, it also means that many of us are feeling more isolated, more disappointed than usual. Our grief and our struggle are heightened. We come to worship to get through the day, the week, to be reminded that Jesus is coming. Of course, even as the story unfolds and we await the arrival of the baby Jesus, we recognize that Jesus has already come, that God is indeed with us. Advent is a time of waiting, but also a time of becoming. In our joy and in our struggle, in the light and in the shadows, we are becoming more aware of God's presence. We are becoming more welcoming and responsive to God's love. 
My name is Norm, and I use he, his pronouns. And I tell you that because Jubilee is an affirming community, which means that we are a safe and welcoming place to all who identify in the LGBTQ2S plus communities. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirited. And also those who are non-binary and those who are helping us become more aware of the glorious diversity of God and God's love. In this time of Advent, we don't open our doors to the diversity of creation. We acknowledge that it's already here. Our siblings are loving and caring in our midst, and we are committed to becoming more aware and responsive to the entirety of God's children. We also acknowledge that some of the history we were taught in Canada was wrong. It's becoming better. But many of us were taught that when Europeans arrived in North America, indigenous peoples, well, we were taught that they were nomads and few in number and that they were poor and they were looking for salvation. And none of that is true. Indigenous peoples had commerce and economies and permanency and stewardship and history and artistry and drama and ceremony, health care, politics, justice, penance, peacekeeping. The land that we now call Canada was already home to nuanced culture and communities. Settlers ignored that reality, soon forgetting that the land upon which Jubilee is set is the traditional home of the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Again, we recognize that Indigenous people were already here when we arrived and are still here. And we still need to be committed to being respectful, just, and loving. We need to commit ourselves to becoming more aware of Indigenous presence, wisdom, justice, concerns, and community. At Jubilee, we provide financial support to the Toronto Urban Native Ministry and will continue to offer opportunities for our community to learn more about the people who welcomed us to this land and who became victims of ignorance and violence as a result. Advent is a time of becoming, a time of hope that real change can happen, a time when we prepare ourselves like a manger to embrace and engage Emmanuel. God is with us. So we'll start with the tough stuff first. At Jubilee, we have suspended all of our in-person worship, and we will keep you informed as to when we can gather safely. But we are reminded that Emmanuel means God is with us. And so indeed, we know that we are not alone. At 2 p.m. today, Haley Brown will be hosting a check-in for parents and kids, and you can find the link on our website. Tonight, Brianne will be leading a service for the longest night, a safe place for grief, for reflection, for all of the feelings and experiences that come with Christmas. The link to this service is on our website. It will be on YouTube Live and Facebook. Now let's get to Christmas Eve. Thursday is Christmas Eve, and at 3 p.m., We'll have a half-hour service for kids and like-minded folk. You can see the pageant again. We're going to sing a couple of songs. We're going to make some noise. Nothing complicated. Just something kind of holy. And then Christmas Eve at 7 p.m., we will have a full service with music and carols and scripture and stories. It'll last about an hour, and it is suitable for all ages, all types of folk, Everybody is invited to celebrate Christmas Eve with us. 10 p.m., Brianne will be hosting a cozy Christmas Eve. You're invited to put on your jammies, make some hot chocolate, and sing along with Brianne and her guitar. Welcome the Christ Child. And then to finish off the evening, at 11 p.m., we will be celebrating communion. Quiet intimate scripture story music the breaking of the bread the pouring of the wine the 
intimate sharing in the body, the blood, the life, and the presence of Jesus Christ. And we thought we'd also add a service for Christmas Day. So on Christmas Day, we will have a short service available at 8 a.m. By the way, all of these services will be released on time, but of course can be viewed anytime afterwards. Definitely not church tonight. We have the 12 songs of Christmas, as well as some commentary, something slightly irreverent, probably something that's gonna upset your grandmother. But definitely not Christmas is available tonight, 7.30. The link is on the website if it wasn't already sent to you. And as always, we thank you for your investment in this ministry that we share. A ministry of inclusion, inspiration, invitation and change without you we couldn't do it but we do have you and we are doing it god bless you thank you as i come to light the christ candle on this the fourth sunday of advent a sunday in which we celebrate love and also celebrate mary i am drawn to the words of the magnificat the words that Mary speaks when she knows, when she knows without a doubt that the child in her womb is of God and will change the world. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. Those words that we call the Magnificat, sung in Latin, sung in English, reimagined words that inspire, words that reveal God's will and God's love. In those words, I experience the light of Christ.
Mary and Joseph lived in a small town. Lived in a small town called Nazareth. Called oh, Nazareth. They were planning. They were planning to marry each other. They marry each other. One night. Oh. Night. When she was blind. When she was blind herself. Mary felt. Mary felt like there was. My friend was someone there with her. My friend was someone there with her. Don't be scared, Mary. You're going to have a baby. Uh, Are you an angel, she asks. Mary had never seen an angel, but she sh was sure this must be an angel. Then someone spoke to her. Be happy, Mary. God has chosen you for a wonderful thing baby you must call this baby Jesus because he will be God's chosen one Mary asked how can this be but if that is what God has planned for me then that is what will happen when Joseph heard about this he was very worried then one night Joseph had a dream he dreamed that there was an angel speaking to him the angel said, don't worry, Joseph, it will all be all right. Yeah. Awesome. Mary could feel the baby growing inside her. It wouldn't be long now, she said to Joseph, her husband. Then one day, Joseph came with some bad news. We have to go to Bethlehem, he said. There are orders from the Roman emperor everybody has to go to the town that their grandparents came from the emperor wants to count how many men he can get to be in his army mary said the baby is almost ready to be born it's hard for me to walk very far uh, very far do i have to go too that is what the empire ordered said joseph he wants to count all the people because we are part of the family of King David. We have to go. Bethlehem is King David's city. Doesn't make any sense, but we have to go. Mary, go. Mary and Joseph were very tired when they reached Bethlehem. They needed to rest, but could not find any place to stay. They tried to get a room in an inn, but all the rooms were taken. Finally, somebody said, you can stay with us. Where? You can stay where they keep the donkey, the cows and donkeys. That's rude. <laughs> it was smelly and dirty and cold, but it was the only place that Mary and Joseph could find. Joseph was angry. A baby should not be born in a place like this. The night, that night in the smelly stable, Mary's baby was born. Joseph wrapped the baby Jesus in some clothes that they brought. They made a soft bed in the straw and all of them laid down to rest. Jesus is a very special baby, said Joseph. Mary and Joseph said thank you to, do, to God for the gift of their beautiful child. Now let's all try to get some sleep, said Mary. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I am giving good news with great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel and multitude of the 
heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? Who has he been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. With him, When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the, the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And not having, and not having been warned in a dream to not go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. It was fulfilled. What was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene.
us pray. Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your eyes. And God, may I never lightly presume to preach your word. May we never lightly presume to hear your word. For in your word is hope. In your word is presence. In your word is abundant life. Amen. Come on, wasn't that a great pageant? Oh, man, I, I loved it. And now, just because I loved it doesn't mean you have to love it. But, but if you didn't love it, you're wrong. No, no, it, it wasn't exactly by the book. And no, it would not stand up as historical documentary. But you got the story, didn't you? You felt the excitement, right? It, it's, it's like a musical. Okay, and everyone knows how I love a musical. I talk about them all the time. The very first musical I saw was Mary Poppins, uh, the movie. Bouncing up and down on my aunt's knee, sitting in the theater. Super califragilistic, expialidocious. You remember, it, it starred Julie Andrews. Available because they didn't want her for My Fair Lady. And Dick Van Dyke was in it, and he had the worst Cockney accent ever recorded, and nobody cared. Oh, I loved that movie. And truthfully, I think I've loved almost every musical that I have ever seen. It started with Mary Poppins and then goes through Godspell, Jesus Christ Superstar, West Side Story, Guys and Dolls, Kiss Me Kate, Little Shop of Horrors, Mary Poppins, the movie sequel. Love that. Into the Woods, Sweeney Todd. I saw Lord of the Rings, the musical, and I loved that too. Now, either you get musicals or you don't. And I'm not talking about good ones versus bad ones. I'm just talking musicals. Because either they do something for you or they don't. My wife used to be one of the ones who, nah, didn't get it. And I would drag her to them, you know, into the Woods, I remember that one quite well, because she just kept saying, Oh, please, don't let them sing again. You could tell the whole story in five minutes if they just shut up. West Side Story, I remember her that one too. I'm supposed to believe that these dancers are a street gang, and that they're going to have a rumble, and that the other guys are supposed to be intimidated. They wouldn't last five minutes in a daycare, never mind the alleys of New York. Oklahoma? Oh yeah, because those are real cowboys. <laughs> and then, then it happened. I, I think it might have been Beauty and the Beast that did the trick. Come on, honey, please. We've got great seats. It's going to be so much fun. Fine. If they would just talk, it would be so much more believable. Instead of bursting into song all the time. And maybe it was the story. Maybe it was the magic of the night. Maybe it was just because I shut up. But all of a sudden, my wife fell in love with musicals. Not all musicals, but, but musicals. Yeah, she still thinks that Sondheim is wordy and the Jets and the Sharks, they're just a little much to believe in West Side Story. But she goes to musicals. She often comes willingly. She even suggests that we go sometimes, laughing and singing along, crying. Okay, no, not, not crying. Uh, that's usually me who's crying at musicals. But she does let the music touch her imagination, and she suspends belief, and she gets into the heart of the story. Wouldn't it be great now to have dancers come out sort of behind me, right? And then for me to burst into song, if this were a musical, but alas, uh, this, this is just a, just a sermon, and so I should probably get into the, the bible stuff. Now, I don't know if you've spent much time reading and comparing the Gospels. I, I don't know um, if I would have done such a thing had I not gone to seminary and felt called into ministry, but there you have it. 
I was called and I did go, and I have spent a fair bit of time reading the Gospels. And because they're not really all that long, I have amused myself by comparing them. John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word. It reads like a novel. Themes are carried throughout the text. There's plots and subplots, quite evidently. There's foreshadowing and all sorts of great stuff that you find in a really good novel. Matthew's Gospel reads like a newspaper. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. Mark's Gospel, considered by most to be the earliest of the Gospels, is written in sort of a matter-of-fact way. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. You see it? With Mark, it's this happened, this happened, then this followed, then this happened, then this other thing happened. Boom, 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 boom. Very matter of fact. And quite satisfying, actually. And it's quite clear that a lot of Mark's raw material is used in the other Gospels. Mark's raw material inspires the plot of John's novel. Uh, it, it adds color to Matthew's journalism. And in Luke, well, Luke, Luke starts off much the same way. Okay, Luke starts his gospel with, Since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. Okay? Very matter of fact. I know what happened, and now I'm going to tell you. And he does exactly that. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. But you see, for me, as soon as I start to hear those words, I start to hear a rhythm in the words. Not Mark's bang, 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 but something that flows. I mean, poetry, yeah, sure, but, but I can hear music in the background. steps up and speaks over the music. We got a baby, folks right here in Bethlehem City. A baby is going to be born in hay that rhymes with J that stands for Jesus. Jesus! Okay, not, not quite. But he does say, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Do you hear the music? Mary does. She hears the music, because it won't be long before she breaks into the words that we call the Magnificat. You've heard versions of them today. Words that are meant to be sung, not just read. Similar words were sung by Hannah centuries before, and now Mary sings them. And in a verse or two, Zechariah breaks into song. Luke, Luke's taken the gospel, right? He's taken Mark's raw material. He has taken the faith, and he's taken the story of Jesus, and he's turned all of this into a musical. Of all the gospels, Luke's is the most musical. 
It's, it's lyrical and fanciful and beautiful. And it's no wonder that it inspires Christmas pageants like the one you just saw. But, but what does that mean to us? I mean, is it time to teach choreography in seminary? Time steps while doing sits and labor? I think that at the very least, it invites us to hear the story of Jesus' birth in the same way that we might experience a musical. The same way that we experience a pageant with our, our ears and our hearts, not just our heads. Right? We, we let the critical voice go for just a little bit and just let it in. Remember the opening from The Lion King? How many of you cried during the opening number? I mean, I can't guarantee it, but I'm pretty sure a lot of you did. And why? Why did you cry at the beginning? I, I don't know. It's because something was happening, and you could just feel it, it welling up. The, the music just inspired this feeling, and it, it got behind your brain, and it reached into your heart. In Frozen, okay, Elsa could say, you know what? I'm done. I'm out of here. But it's way cooler when she sings, let it go, let it go, let it go. Okay, it's a lot cooler when she does it. Why doesn't the angel Gabriel just say, hey, Mary, uh, you're pregnant? Don't panic. It's God's baby. It's going to be okay. Because that doesn't have nearly the power of, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Ah, oh, man. So much better. Why doesn't Mary say, wow. Okay, cool. I, yeah, I feel God's with me, and this baby is going to be some really good news to some very sad people. No, she needs to sing it. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And the world is about me. Ah, it's music. Years later, I can sing almost any song from any musical that I've ever seen, except Frozen, as you noticed. And that's what Luke wants. Luke wants you singing the Magnificat years after you've heard it. When the service is over today, he wants you humming it and thinking about the words and feeling it well up inside you like the beginning of The Lion King. He wants you bouncing up and down like a kid seeing Mary Poppins for the first time. Every time you tell the story of Jesus' birth, not worrying about reality and could it happen like this, no. Luke's gospel, like a musical, like a pageant, it's not meant to be an intellectual endeavor. It's a tour de force. It's not anti-intellectual, but the focus is not, not on the brain. It's on the emotions. It's on the spirit. It's meant to fill you with wonder. It's trying to communicate things that we, we just don't know how to say with words. Just like in Oklahoma, we're not actually invited to be critical about the authenticity of the cowboys, or the street gangs in West Side Story, or the gamblers and guys and dolls, or the snowmen in Frozen, because that wasn't much of a snowman. And I don't know how long it took Mary to get to Elizabeth or what the journey was like. And I don't know if the baby leapt in Elizabeth's womb or if Mary hit her mark and started singing on cue. I have no idea. What I do know is that Luke doesn't want you to read the gospel. Any gospel, frankly, but particularly his. He doesn't want you to read it. He doesn't want the Christmas story to be embraced in a literal way. 
He wants us to sing it. He wants us to look beyond the words, beyond the details and into the poetry and the music and recognize the deeper truths that resonate deep inside beyond words. He wants us to feel the story in our bones. Jesus comes to us in ways that we can never, ever expect. There is no way to be prepared, and yet there is nothing to fear. God breaks into our lives in ways that jolt us, but at the same time comes to us vulnerable and precious, not forceful and dominating. How do you explain that to someone with mere words? I don't know. But I do know that music lets you feel. And music lets you cry. Music lets you know things beyond your cognitive ability. Could there be a better way to engage God? Luke doesn't think so. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the music of the Christmas story. We thank you for the ways that it inspires us, fills us beyond simple words. And God, we ask that from this moment, through Christmas and beyond, that we become singers and dancers ourselves. Let music fill our lives and let us invite others to sing and dance with us and with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that your ancient words would still leap off our pages? Mary, did you know that your spirit song would echo through the ages? Did you know that your holy cry would be subversive words? That the tyrants would be trembling When they knew your truth is heard Mary, did you know That your lullaby Would stir your own child's passion Mary, did you know That your song inspires The work of liberation Did you know Who yearn for it to start? Oh, Mary, did you know? The truth will teach the drama.
and we come to this moment in prayer. We pray for everything that Mary knew, everything that Mary said. We take some time to pray for justice. We pray for trembling tyrants. May they let go. May their influence on us and the world be gone. We pray for truth. Truth in our lives. Truth in our relationships. Truth in ourselves. We pray for healing. Healing of the world. Healing in our relationships healing within ourselves. God, bring us together, the rich and the poor, the near and the distant, the dominating and the struggling. the dreaming and the making real. Bring us all together that we might live in hope, that we might creatively hear Mary's words, that we might share Mary's courage and her confidence. Let us pray. Gathering all our prayers into one, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Loving God, let us go from this moment singing and dancing and inviting everyone to join in the chorus. Knowing that we do not sing, we do not dance because we are talented. We sing and we dance because we are loved. We sing and we dance because God the Creator is with us. Because Jesus is not only coming to a manger in Bethlehem, but is here with us now. We sing and we dance because the Holy Spirit absolutely surrounds and fills each and every one of us until we gather again, and that's when it will be Christmas. <laughs> Amen. Amen.